This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Stevenson Ministries and the Houston Faith Church family. Romans chapter 15. Now we finished 14 last week talking about not being a stumbling block uh, to the weak, meaning those who think certain things are sins, then you hold back. Even though they may not be sins, you hold back if, if they might possibly think it's uh, inappropriate. Uh, because we care about other people's walk, not just our own. Amen. Verse uh, 1, chapter 15. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Scruples being weaknesses or failures or those who are weak in the faith, as chapter 14 began. Um, verse 2, let us each please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. So your life is not just to please yourself. You've got to care about somebody else and uh, uh, be sensitive about that. Be considerate. Uh, have other people in mind. Your actions matter. Verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me, or those who insulted, uh, insult, reproach being insult, uh, the insults of those who insulted you fell on Christ. So he got insulted just like you. So how many of you can be insulted and take it like a Christian? I mean, really, can you be insulted to your face and take it like a Christian? Have you done it lately? The fast food restaurant? Have you felt insulted anywhere and said, and just smiled and thought, oh, poor person? I hear some whispering going on, but that's about it. <laughs> Come on, you got to teach your children how to take insults like a Christian and not retaliate. I'm not talking about getting run over and beat up and losing teeth over it. I'm talking about, you know, being able to stand tall and happy and healthy and not be, not be upset when somebody bullies you. Teach your kids, teach your teenagers how to be a real Christian. And there's a lot of little work that goes into that and a lot of reminders and a lot of coaching. And so when you get in the business world and they insult you, what are you going to do? Verse four, for whatever things were written... Before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, that's a, in, in, my, in my page here, it's, it's kind of underlined a couple times here. Uh, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures. If you ever think you need comfort in life, it's the word that's going to do it. If you need patience and comfort, you, you're going to have to find it in the scripture. You're going to have to learn how when you're kind of frantic or uh, conflicted or chaotic or upset or in an emergency or in a state of whatever you're in, uh, run to the Bible and get comforted. You should be able to go to the Bible and in 15 minutes be comforted. You really, you should learn how to do that. There, there is a supernatural power available to you through the scriptures to comfort you, to give you patience, to chill you out, to calm your nerves. So if you're thinking, I've got to call, I'm so anxious, I've got to call my nerve. If you don't know how to go to the Word of God, then uh, uh, we're locking the doors on you tonight. <laughs> so, somehow we've got to emphasize that you're, you're missing out on basic Christianity. Basic Christianity. 101 for the Christian is you've got to find out the way. You've got to learn the secrets to, to receive the comfort from Scripture. Amen. Teenagers included. Right. Teenagers included. Teenagers need to learn how to run to the scriptures and get comfort. That's right. Verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort. He's called the God of patience and comfort. Right. He's not some mean God, you know, hammering people. He's comforting people. He's the God of patience and comfort. Uh, grant, so if you don't feel patient and if you don't feel comforted, you're not close enough to God. Uh -oh. Listen, I'm not putting you down. I'm not condemning you. I'm saying, listen, listen, you're not close enough. You may think you are, but you're not if you don't have comfort. So what that means is you got to take about an hour or two and go uh, draw near to him 
and he'll draw near to you, and then all of a sudden you'll feel better. Amen. You have a choice sometimes when you're in a place that doesn't feel right. You can either run and go eat and get overstuffed so that it kind of knocks you out, or you can run to God and get comforted. Right. You know, they call them comfort foods. I'm not just making this stuff up. I'm telling you, people run to the food a lot to, to get comfort. Right. Well, I'm all for comfort foods at least every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> but you need, a, you need to learn the art of getting comfort straight from God. Amen. Straight from God on a daily basis, weekly basis. A lifestyle of just right. living in comfort. Luxury. Everything's smooth and, and easy and I'm okay. Everything's fine. You know, some, some wild thing happens at the house. So, you know, some chaotic thing goes on. You're like, what's going on over there? Hmm. I'm patient. I'm not going to get moved by every little thing that goes on. Right. <clears throat> then you pull out your, your whip. <laughs> you handle it with, with calm and collectedness and coolness. And maybe y'all need to watch a John Wayne movie every once in a while. He'll show you how to just, just be cool. Come on, pilgrim, just be cool. He'll show you how to walk. You can even walk, learn to walk watching John Wayne. Verse 6, uh, let me read the first, uh, verse 5. God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Here he is, he, he's, he's saying that I hope God will grant you to be like-minded. To grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, you need to start thinking the same way toward each other. Around here, this is what we think church in includes. And, and, you know, there's a lot of styles of different churches, but I think uh, real ecclesia, real church life includes you and I being uh, instructed, commanded, reminded, admonished, rebuked, corrected, uh, practiced in having like-mindedness. So everybody comes from a different place, different neighborhood, different history, different past, different everything. Uh, and, and as a Christian, you got to learn to, to think like Christ. And that means think the same. So unity is very important to us. So you need to be doing your part to think the same as, a, as, as other Christians would. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. People think worship is a totally individualistic experience, and it's not. Well, I just do it my own way. No, one mind, one mouth glorify God. Amen. It's quiet. You could hear a cotton ball drop. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Here he says a servant to the circumcision, the circumcision being the Jewish people. That's what they were called, the circumcision. So he was a servant to the Jewish people for the truth of God. To prove out all the promises. He came to fulfill that law for them. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So the, the door of this gospel opened up to the Gentiles. Now we get to glorify God too for his mercy upon us. Who didn't even know God. Didn't even care about God. Had no clue. No heritage of anything with God. As it is written, for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. Excuse me, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud non-Jews, and laud him, all you people. And again, Isaiah says, there will be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. Another word for Gentile is heathen. It's the non-covenant people. Uh, which now we have covenant through Christ. Verse 13, 
Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Let me read it one more time. Now may the God of hope, so he's also called the God of hope. He's the God of patience. You know, he's the God of truth. He's the God of a lot of things. I mean, he's the God of all, but uh, uh, characteristically, it helps us recognize, wow, this is like really important to him because it's his character. He's the God of hope. You need a big hope in your life. You need a big destiny. You need a big desire. You need a, a real substantial um, request and desire and desired end, expected end from God. You, you need to decide some real holy spiritual things that you expect and even some, some natural things maybe that you want to get God involved in and ask him to bring. To, you need some real hope here. And it begins with your eternal hope. Like, don't just put off heaven because it's far from here or, or long from here in the timeline. Go ahead and establish that as this is a big deal. Like, this is the main thing I need to want. Eternity with God is the main thing that you should want. Everybody wants a new toy next week, but the main thing you need and want is eternal life with God. Cherish it, desire it, get saved and cling to it. Hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. How many of you would like to have some joy and peace in your life? People get prayed for, pray for me to have some peace. I'm just, I need some joy. I'm depressed. I'm not happy. Please fix. Please help. Yes, God will do all that. He'll help. He'll fix. He'll deliver. He'll restore. He'll heal. And that's part of this walk. But notice this, he will fill you with all joy and peace. Okay, so you need to be, if you're full of joy and someone touches you, what's going to come out? <laughs> if you're filled with peace and something attacks you, what's going to come out? No problem, no problem. If you're full of peace and joy, something's different about you. You smile a little bit more. You laugh a little quicker. Things roll off your back a lot easier. If you're full of joy, man, you don't get all strung out over little things. Amen. Every little insignificant thing that doesn't go right during the day doesn't cause you to get all stern and upset. Amen. Glory to God. Somehow that'll get fixed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We'll get that. No problem. I can just overlook a lot of, I'm full of joy. Nothing's going to take my joy, not even for a 60 seconds. May he fill you with all joy and peace. So that's a great, great hope, right? That's a great thing to have and desire. But notice how it happens. He'll fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So this is not something that you accidentally get. It's not something that you... Uh, just kind of run into. No, you have to believe. Come on. You'll have joy and peace in believing. Come on. And it begins with eternal life. If you can believe that very strongly of your salvation, of who you are in Christ, of righteousness by faith alone, of acceptance with God, uh, being a child of God, being a holy one, being called for his purpose. If you'll learn how to believe that, Come on. I mean, believe it with all your heart, Amen. Amen. man, that'll give you some joy. Woo. In the middle of the world, in the middle of life, you need some joy and peace. You can only get joy and peace in believing. And you can also take this principle and apply it into all sorts of things in your daily endeavor, your life endeavor, which would be striving for what? To be successful at work. You're going to have to believe God's involved in that in order to have some joy and peace for health. You're going to have to believe some healing scripture, some truth about God. Believe the power of God or you won't have joy and peace. And so if you don't have joy and peace, that's evidence for yourself that you really don't believe. If it comes to healing or deliverance for yourself or your family, if you don't have joy and peace, you haven't believed yet. Oh no, I'm believing God. I'm believing. No, no, if you were believing, 
You have joy and peace and it would, it would supplant, it would uproot, it would eliminate the dread and the, the lack of joy and the, the friction and the, and the little uncertainty and that, oh, that dread. So it's evidence for you. It's not to condemn you. It's not to say, see, you'll never get there. No, it's to show you, do I have real faith or not? Am, am I really believing or, or not? Because if I'm really believing, man, I'm looking like it. Well, I don't feel like going to church. You know, things are going kind of wrong, and I'm just trusting God. No, 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 you're not. No, you're not believing God at all. Because if you were believing God, you'd, you'd hop up and run to church, all excited and happy and joyful and full of peace. See the difference? See, so faith, real faith people do it differently. They do it scripturally. So you need to take a scripture like this and says, he will fill me with joy and peace if I can believe. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You got to abound. So that you can abound in hope. You cannot lose hope. Don't lose your hope. You must abound in hope, but you can only do it if you believe. How many of you have hope for anything? Would you say that it's actually abounding? If you don't, if you can't say, yep, here's why it's abounding, then you need to do some abounding. You need to do some extra stuff or something. You need to really decide, okay, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Like I know right now, some of you are like abounding in hope for your tax return, your refund to come. You're abounding in hope. I mean, I know it. I've, I've, I've heard people talk about it already. You're abounding in hope. You have this great expectation of tax refund day. Okay, now, now listen, I want you to understand this and, and compare this, the excitement, the anticipation, the planning, the confidence, the, this is going to be a wonderful day. All of that is called hope. And people are abounding in hope for tax refund day. Many people do. They, they abound in great, great hope for tax refund day. And, and you're absolutely confident. I mean, you're abounding in hope because you know that they're going to pay you. They're not, they're not really paying you. They're giving it back to you. They've used it all year. They've used it all year. It made money off you. But anyway, they're going to give it back. And that's very exciting. They're going to give me my money back. That's called hope. You're abounding in hope. You've got plans for this. It's a big deal. It's needed for the family. You've got it all allocated, man. You're thinking extra Okay, do you have that kind of hope for other things you've asked God for? Whether it's a job or extra income or health or deliverance or something for your kid or do you have that kind of confident, abounding desire and expectancy? God's about to answer me. I cannot wait. It's about to happen. Glory to God. I'm so happy. Because if you don't, have something similar, you're not believing God yet. You're not really believing yet. Because when you're believing, you're abounding in hope. Isn't that right? Praise the Lord. Verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you're also, you're also all full of goodness. That you also are full of goodness. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Are you full of goodness? Amen. Hardly anybody looked up, but <laughs> <clears throat> this is a challenge for you from God. From the Holy Spirit. Are you full of goodness? What kind of deceit 
is in you? What kind of trickery, facade, hypocrisy? Goodness would be the opposite. How much honesty is in there? What kind of ulterior motives do you live in? What kind of selfish ambition are you here for? I know you can take it south real quick, can't you? Listen, this is up to you. You got to squeeze out all that uh, non-good stuff. Come on, good. You got to be full of good. If you're full of goodness, man, that when people get around you, there's no, there's no feeling. There's not even an ounce of feeling of dishonesty coming from you. I can trust your words. I see your heart. I can touch you easily. You're not protecting yourself. You're, you're out there. You're loving people. You got to be full of goodness. Can we find a faithful man? Are you faithful? Are you faithful and good? Can we trust your words? Can you trust your words? Okay, let me just get back here. Full of goodness, full of goodness. Everybody full of goodness? Okay, let's move along. <laughs> Filled with all knowledge. We know y'all are full of knowledge. <laughs> Filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. <laughs> Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. <clears throat> you know, the pastor has a certain grace to be able to challenge you in some of these really sensitive areas. Not everybody maybe can do that. That's what he's saying. He's saying the grace has been given to me and I've been more boldly on some matters here. Verse 16, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, he's, the, the Romans were Gentiles. They were non-Jewish people. The gospel had come to them. He's explaining all things related to God and covenant to them. They understood some because Jews were all over. Uh, but he's addressing them particularly as people who did not know God and now do. Verse 17, uh, verse 16 again, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is, hey, I know you believed in Jesus, but now I, as I'm presenting you to God, I want it to be wonderful. And that's partly why this gospel includes more than just getting people saved. We're going to spread the whole world with getting people saved. And then we do expect as time permits and as the will of God orchestrates, we're going to teach them as well. Verse 17, therefore I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. What he's saying is, uh, I'm not going to use only examples from others it's going to have to, I'm going to talk about stuff that God has actually accomplished through me. So you can tell stories from others, but you also need to have your own stories. Right. To make the Gentiles obedient. So in word and deed. So he's talking about uh, God has accomplished this in me in word and deed. And that's why the gospel includes both word and action, deed, good things, power, uh, uh, the hand of God getting to stretch forth, word and deed. It's not just a message, it's also proof and evidence of a message. We need uh, witness of the resurrection. How can you have witness of the resurrection? Because none of you were there. The only way to have witness of the resurrection is signs and wonders. The first being, okay, the new birth, but that's so invisible. Uh, the only real witness on the outside of the resurrection, since Jesus is not walking around letting everybody see that he's risen, is signs and wonders through his name. Verse 19, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So let's read verse 18 and 19 again. I'll not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Notice that's the goal. The goal is to make believers obedient. Right. Amen. The word helps you become obedient and walk in the will of God. 
The signs and wonders help you become obedient and walk in the will of God. And that's why we say that you need some monuments of God's power in your life because they keep you anchored in times of uncertainty. We walk by faith and not by sight, but there are, there are moments in your history you should have one, two, three, 10, 20, uh, that help you say, you know what? I know for sure God is real because something happened to me. To make the Gentiles, the heathen, obedient. Verse 19, in mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I fully preached the gospel of Christ. Here's where we get the term full gospel. Fully preached the gospel. You really can't fully preach the gospel without power. You really can't fully preach this great gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ without power. Signs and wonders, healings, deliverances, some sort of manifestation of the Spirit. And so it does take us committed to that where we press in at times to make sure even in a congregation of believers, we see something. When it comes to unbelievers, you have to even press further to make sure that the gospel is presented with power. Oral Roberts, uh, not Oral Roberts, uh, uh, T.L. Osborne, who was one of our first great evangelistic missionaries, uh, really just, a, he was just an evangelist, the scriptural way. And he preached to millions, uh, mostly overseas. But he said, if anyone who cannot uh, demonstrate the gospel is not fit to preach it. Amen. And it, he began saying that after he, as a non-full gospel type preacher, tried to do mission work and evangelism work without the power And then he's all discouraged and God shows him, wait a second, you're going to have to go do this. I'll back you up. Changed everything. Lots of ministers have started off just teaching and preaching and then realized, oh, wait, the power of God will help this. And so we do owe it to the Lord to make sure we preach the full gospel. They used to call it full gospel denomination or full gospel type ministry. Now we say spirit filled. At one point they called it charismatic because they were charis being gifts. They believed in the gifts of the spirit. Uh, I don't know what they call themselves now, but we're still full gospel, spirit filled, Pentecostal, charismatics, faith folks, Bible believing, tongue talking, devil chasing, We owe it to the Lord to fully preach the gospel. And so I feel like I can't leave stuff out. I can't ignore things. Eventually it all has to be preached. And that's one of the reasons I like to go through books of the Bible. Because I'm forced to preach it. You're forced to listen. (laughs) But if you don't come to church all the time, you won't have it. Uh, So that's why I'm going to redo it. I'm going to do Romans again next year. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Verse 20, and so I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Now, of course, it's okay to have traveling preachers who come preach here. Uh, He's talking about as an apostle to get this gospel spread fast and far as as much as he could before his last day. Uh, That's what he's saying. Being careful not to, uh, if it's already got a foundation, let me go to someone who doesn't have one. There's enough that doesn't have them. Verse 20, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build another man's foundation. But as it's written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. To those who have not heard shall understand. Meaning, they didn't have any prophecies or predictions of a Messiah coming, but he's going to be announced to them anyway. Verse 22, for this reason, I've also been much hindered from coming to you. Talking about the devil hindering him. But now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I'll come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Notice that, going to Jerusalem, where all the Jews are, to minister to the saints, the saved Jews. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints 
who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles, non-Jews, have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is to minister to them, the Jews, in material things. Okay, now that's an interesting concept, right? So all these non-Jews in the beginning were getting the gospel from the Jews that came from Jerusalem who believed in Christ. And it's like, wait a second, they're giving you the gospel. Doesn't, is it, doesn't it seem fitting to return some material things for someone who gave you something so valuable? That's what he's saying. Now, some have incorrectly used this passage and said, see, we, the church, should be giving to Israel. Because they gave us Jesus, the Messiah, we should give to Israel. That's not what the scripture said. He said he wanted the collection for the poor saints. In in the New Testament, the church is commanded to take care of one another. In the church. Never is the church commanded to take care of the community poor. In the same way, we are commanded to take care of Christians who are in need, but not necessarily all the heathen in need. And certainly not necessarily uh, all of Israel who aren't being, they're not really in the church. They're not Christians. They're not saints. So Paul is talking about taking care of the poor saints. And it only is fitting because, hey, they gave us the gospel. And it was very fresh in that moment. So, you know, in in reality, uh, we're here today because of the gospel that came from the early apostles, right? But there's a lot of things that happened in between. So I think what you see is the principle that whoever did distribute you the gospel, you ought to take care of them. One of the principles I live by is whoever gave me the the gospel, the instruction, uh, the advancement, uh, then then I I owe it to give to them. And that's why you've heard me say that those who have my first two big ministers that I would call my fathers in the faith, I still, we still to this day support them in the ministry. We still, every month, send them something every month. Now, it's not more than the tithe. The tithe only and always goes to the local church. Since all of you are giving 10% plus, we're giving 10% plus here. This is our work. So that's what we all owe one another is to give and support 10% plus here. Then there's some extra here, and then there's some extra for all of your other projects. All of the other... uh, support and offerings and distribution to your former fathers in the faith or people out uh, in, the, in other ministries and such, but you would never neglect here to give out, just like we would never do that. But I do still owe those people that gave me the gospel. You've heard me say, if it wasn't for Brother Copeland, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Brother Hagen, I would not be here. Oh no, God would have found another way. Oh, then I would have supported the other way. <laughs> you got to value the one that gave you the oracles of God. The one that really, you need to value them. Even if it's just a little, just an acknowledgement, just a token. Uh, and the reason that I'm, I know they're not poor. <laughs> I know that not everyone you support in ministry has to be poor. So this time about poor saints. And he's saying, he's given, then he's given a principle. They gave us spiritual things. Isn't it fitting to give them back? And then we can go to uh, 1 Corinthians 9. Go there real quick. 1 Corinthians 9, because this principle is, is confirmed with two or three witnesses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1, he says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And, and he's, only, he's only asking these things. You know, he does this a couple times in Scripture, giving them this carnal argument. He said, I speak as a fool. Like, since you're being so foolish with your rebellion in your questions, I'm going to get on your level and I'm going to talk like a man. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and answer your questions that are quite stupid. And so here he's saying, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ? Are you not my work in the Lord? Am I not an, if I'm not an apostle to others, doubtless I am to you for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He's saying, listen, Hey, we can talk about others. Maybe there's some uh, gray area there. But for you, for sure, I know that I, I helped found this whole thing in Corinth. Amen. Verse 3, my defense to those who examine me. You know, you, get, you got saints examining preachers all the time. My defense to those who, are examine, who examine me is this. 
Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do, other the, the, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas or Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Obviously, what was the complaint against the apostle? The complaint was, hey, you're just taking money and you're not working. All that shows is they don't value what he is doing. They don't value the teaching, the preaching, the gospel spreading, the gift of God, the calling of God, the office of God. Verse 7, and because of this, you know, here, here at church, we make sure that if we invite a preacher to come preach here, you can bring your family if you want. Bring, bring whoever you want. Why? Because I, I, see, the, I see that that's a, that's a deal here. That's something in Scripture. It's like, oh, I got a great example. There, you can bring your wife. Can I bring my wife? You can bring your wife. You sure? Yeah, you can bring your wife. How many, how many kids you got? Verse 7, whoever goes to war, to, notice it says, uh, is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So preachers, in order to commit fully and, and uh, not have to have time and effort taken up working a, a natural job, sometimes they're able to refrain from working. If you have full-time gospel work going on, you shouldn't be able to refrain from working a secular job. Some people say, well, Paul was a tent maker, and so he made tents. Well, here he's talking about refraining from working. So don't just use that one example, because it says that he when, he, when he got to Priscilla and Aquila, he helped them make tents because that was his profession also, you know, before he was an apostle. And so while he was with them, he, he was a tent maker with them. Sure, sure, that's what you would do if, if, if time permitted. I've done that before when I used to travel and preach. I remember I preached for a certain pastor. I stayed in his home, and uh, he, was digging a, he was digging a pond out back. And he had a tractor, and he had a bulldozer. And I got on the bulldozer during the day. While I preached for him during the week, I got on the bulldozer during the, during the day and helped him. Well, that just makes perfect sense. Let's not overdo it, right? No preacher should be trying not to work. And what we like to tell ministers is, hey, listen, you should be working a good 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And if you're not doing 40, 50 hours a week in the gospel, then go ahead and get a part-time job. If you want a part, if you want a full-time salary, you better be working a full-time, you better be putting in full-time hours because a lot of pastors think, oh, I can do a couple hours a week in, in, in a pulpit and then just the rest of the week, I'll just do family errands. Fine, fine, you'll get two hours worth of pay. It's fine. I'm talking about, we, you know, spreading the gospel, preparing, reaching the lost, doing something to promote the gospels, traveling, whatever you, do something to spread the gospel, taking care of the flock, doing something like that. When we first started the church, we had a little extra time on our hands. I printed gospel tracts. I sweat in the print shop. <laughs> so you got to find a way to be productive no matter what you're doing. So these days you can stay, you know, most ministers, if you have anything in you, you can stay uh, busy all the time, right? See, y'all are all enthused about it. It's like, <laughs> let me get back to the scripture. You can at least believe the scripture. Verse seven, whoever goes to war at his own expense, who, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends to a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Or do I say things as a mere man, or does not the law also say the same? For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen that God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, it's written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. You should expect, and I should expect, that every single pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet, apostle that's preaching the gospel ought to be partakers of of the fruit of it. That means the people that are receiving and growing ought to be able to supply a livelihood for their, their preachers. Nobody should have a problem with that. If you value the product, you don't have any problem with it. Isn't that right? You would never tell a farmer, hey, we love your corn, but we're not paying for it. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, to natural people, Spiritual stuff doesn't make any sense. So those are the ones, natural, carnally minded people are the ones that hate the fact that there's money involved in the gospel. I mean, Elon Musk and Tesla, I want that Tesla, I will pay whatever it costs because I value it. Verse 
Ford. Okay, who's, the, who's, who's leading Ford these days? Verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? That's the, the end of it here. This is that principle that he, he also said over in Romans. It's the exchange, material things for spiritual things. Very scriptural. Uh, it's part of our doctrine. It's part of the principles of the foundation of Christ. We ought to just be glad about it and uh, at least start valuing the gospel some. Amen. And if you haven't yet, I challenge you. The word challenges you. If you're getting anything spiritual from teachers and, and the word, you should be able to supply back. I think these days we've said several times that uh, with everything online and, and all that you see and have access to so easily, so quickly, without any commitment or accountability, think of how many hours of teaching and preaching that you've heard and gleaned from and gave zero. Well, I can't, I can't afford to give to everything that I'm... Well, then quit watching it. See, what's, what's happened is we become cheaters. We're cheating ourselves, and we're not growing like we should. We're just becoming gluttons, heaping to ourselves teachers, having itching ears, just gluttons, and we're not valuing the gospel properly. We're not valuing gifts properly. We're not valuing the office properly, and I think it's doing a disservice to us spiritually. You think you got all this knowledge, and you know everything, and you're some big highfalutin thing. Like you learn from all these different, and it's like, oh, let me promote all these and tell everybody what they should be watching. You don't have the clout to do that. You're not the one that's supposed to be telling everybody who to listen to. So we're just puffed up. I'll tell you something that'll unpuff your head. Start giving some offerings. Everybody take a big deep breath and a sigh of relief because it's, <laughs> hey, look, if I don't talk about these things, who's going to? <clears throat> Therefore, verse 28, Romans 15, 28. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed them to this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I'll come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining Pastors Chaz and Joni today from Houston Faith Church. If you're looking for a good home church in Houston, Texas, we'd like to invite you to be our guest anytime. What you'll find is that Houston Faith Church is highly committed to the Word of God, the love of God, and the Spirit-filled life and ministry that Jesus expects. We know that everyone wants to make a difference in this life, and that the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ is the main thing for all of us. You'll find your purpose here and grow strong in faith at Houston Faith Church. Find more faith-building resources on our YouTube channel or subscribe to our free audio podcast. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. See you soon.